All right, here we go. Um, we got a lot to cover. So the next point is number six, invest in your future. And again, I said uh, before, life's biggest and largest expense is retirement. Do you know what another fancy word for retirement is? Permanent unemployment. You still have bills coming in. Believe me, anyone retired here, do the bills go away? No. But the money needs to keep coming because of that, so you need to, you need to invest. Now, inside your note-taking guide, uh, there should be a couple of extra things, handouts that I provided there. And one of them looks like a house. Do you see it? With the puzzle pieces, like up here. So, most of my career, actually, this is just for fun here today, but my career that I get paid to do is retirement planning, investments, um, helping people come up with a retirement plan and what to do with their money to get them through that period where they've shut off the spigot of income from their job, but they still have to live. So, over on the left... This is something we use in our business called your financial blueprint, a blueprint you use to build a house. And you're going to live in the financial house that you built in your working years. You're going to live in that in your retirement years. So that house needs to have a foundation. And I understand some of the words there are American. I apologize. But Social Security, you have your pensions here, Canada Pension, uh, and then if there's other pensions that you might get through your work, and then if there's other income-producing investments. Somebody asked me about real estate. Don't get into it if you don't know what you're doing. Don't get into it if you're already in a bind financially. But if you're free and you're young enough and you're willing to, um, there's work involved in it. I love real estate. I have real estate. It's a good income producer for retirement. Um, and there's risk there. Yep, most things have risk. But real estate can be good. In the States, we have things, annuities, dividends off a of stock, uh, bond interest off a of bond. There's all kinds of in income producing investments that you use to build your income. But in addition to income in retirement, you also want some other money that's growing to be used later, five years from now, 10 years from now, buy your next house, go on a trip. Hopefully, retirement isn't just about existing, although, you know, for some it is, and you're blessed if you can at least still maintain. But You've got to have your other money to grow, and so that's the middle of the house. And so there's certain things that impact the growth of your money. And uh, let me just come off the script here and listen to me for a second. If you are, and again, this is really difficult because everybody's situation is different. Just like if we all had the ability and somebody gave us a million dollars and we could build whatever house we wanted, and it could be your custom house. Everybody's home in here will look different than somebody else's because some will want a basement, some will not. Some will want a, a man cave, and many will not. And some will want, you know, woman's sewing room or something that, a reading room, a library. That's what my wife would want. So everybody's home is different, but um, we need to invest according to our age, and it's really risky. So don't hold me to this exactly to speak to a general group and tell them how they should invest because I would tell you if you don't know how, go find somebody to help you. Find an investment professional. Pay for things that you're not good at yourself. There's a lot of things I'm not good at and we pay for someone who is good at them. If you needed surgery, how many in the room would mail order a scalpel and do your own surgery on yourself? No, you go to a doctor who is a professional at that, and someone, 
your taxes are paying for that doctor to do that. Pay for help of things that you don't know yourself. But if you are just starting out between ages 25 and say 50 or 55, and you're still maybe 10 years from retirement, if you have money left over to invest in the stock market or whatever it is, find low-cost funds, diversify, and don't be afraid to take a pretty sizable amount of risk. I know that's scaring some of you. You've got to take risk and be aggressive for the long-term growth. If it's not long-term growth, if it's money you're going to use a year from now, two years from now, five years from now, don't be overly aggressive. That's not long-term money. It's right around the corner money. you got to act differently with that. But if it's long-term growth, you're 30 years old and the stock market goes down. Pete, I had $20,000 and it's now 16. I'm going the wrong direction. What should I do? Put more in. Find more because it's now on sale. And when it does come back, which so far it always has, no matter how bad it looked for a period of time, put more in and buy more on sale. And then when it comes back up, you benefit from that. So if you are here in your 20s, 30s, 40s, early 50s enough that you know you're about 10 years from retirement, and you have any money, $100 a month or whatever it is that you can put into RRSPs and those kind of things, find things that are low cost. So go to your broker, advisor, financial guy, Vanguard if you have them up here, mutual funds or something that is low cost, highly diversified, and quite aggressive. Because that is down the road money, decades away. You know, the market's going to go up and down hundreds of thousands of times. And put in consistently. And don't stop, even when it's going the opposite direction. You have to, like, a lot of the Bible is, if you want to find your life, you deny it. You know, they're like opposites. Well, in investing, you put the most in, the more poorly it's doing. And the better it's doing, well, you still put some in, but you're not going to do, that's not going to benefit you because you're buying at a premium and not on sale. Now, if you are in the room and you're already retired, or you're five to seven years from retirement, it's not way down the road money, it's right around the corner money. Now, Again, unless you are a really good professional at it yourself, the reason you need to get help is what do you invest in now? Well, more moderate. It's not as aggressive. You don't want it to be standing still. That money I said was in my sock drawer that we gave away to Bree, that's not making any money. That's not our retirement investment money. You can't have your retirement investment money making no money. You've got to have it earning and keeping up with inflation at least. But you're in what we call in our firm the red zone of retirement. You're zoning in on the end line of work. And now you still need it to grow, but you've got to keep what you've got. And every year you get closer to retirement. So you're four years, three years, two years, one year. You've got to be more careful with that money. It's not anymore just what you make in the good years, it's what you don't lose in the bad years. So you shouldn't be as aggressive as your children are typically. Uh, so then you've got the roof of the house. We'll deal with that in a later section. But then over here on the right, this is just two different pictures. We like to paint pictures in our firm and talk about building your financial house. And then the other one is your family retirement blueprint. And in our firm, there's five pillars that we walk people through and we help them with to plan. Because you also want a, finan a financial planner who actually plans and doesn't just sell you stuff. There's nothing wrong with them selling you a mutual fund or a stock or investments or that. That's what you do. You're the buyer, they're the seller. But you also want somebody who's more than that, who is a planner that gives you a goal. It's like, again, you put the bullseye on the fence and you aim towards the bullseye. So what we walk people through is 
needing to have an income plan. What is your income plan when you're not working anymore? You're not fishing anymore. You're not at the plant anymore, whatever it is. When that income stops, what's your income plan? You have to have one. Not an income hope, not a maybe, not I think so, not, you know, a wing and a prayer. I believe in prayer. I think I've made that clear. But I also know that there's planning involved. Income and then your investments. You, every investment needs to have a plan. When is, when is this going to be used? Well, 25 years from now. Well, then it needs to be in these kind of things. When is this used? Well, five years from now, it's a little bit different. When is this going to be used? Next week. Well, that's different. So you need an income plan. Then you need a tax plan. Somebody to make sure that you're not paying any more in taxes. It's not what we make. It's what we get to what? Keep, spend, taxes. In our area, in our firm, we have a CPA, a forward-looking tax planner, that sits down with our families and shows them not just what they can save money in taxes today, but what about five years from now, ten years from now, and so on. You know what? Sometimes it means paying more now to pay less later. Sometimes we're willing and wanting the immediate gratification. Do you all have that here in Yarmouth, immediate gratification? We don't have much delayed gratification down where I'm at. It's I want it now, I want it yesterday. Sometimes with taxes, if you could pay $100 now, but it would save you $1,000 later, might that be a good deal? So sometimes there are ways to do that. So tax planning, then health care planning. Maybe, maybe not as big a thing up here, I don't know. But down our way, we've got to have a health care plan for when we're retired. And then we have to have a legacy plan, which is one of the next points. So I'm not going to spend much time there. But this is your investments and investing for the future and having a plan to do that. I wish I had more time because there's so much more to talk about. But there are some good book resources that I've made available on the back of your sheet. Today isn't giving you all the answers. It's telling you where to find the answers. One good book is The Automatic Millionaire. Even the books that I have, there's uh, chapters in there on investments. And the lucky people who won the book, Money Enough for Life, which was not the one that I was giving here today, um, but the other one that I think two or three or four people got, uh, there's sections in there on investing. But on that list of books, there's things in there on investing. And then you can also go to Joe Sangel, S-A-N-G-L, his sites on the Internet and find additional resources. The, the key is invest, invest even small amounts and do it consistently. David Bach, who I told you, um, he spoke to our clients and, and he's well thought of. Uh, he wrote a book called The Automatic Millionaire. And what he said is that if it comes into our home, we consume it. Remember the three buckets? Contingency, which is the second bucket, is retirement and investing. We never get over to the contingency because we consume it because when it comes into our bank account, we just consider it fair game. So he says what the best thing to do is have it automatically go into the investment. You never see it, touch it, look at it, don't even think of it as your own. That's the easiest way to do it. I agree with that. Uh, next slide. Number seven, protect your assets. If you have a nest egg at all, now you got to protect what you've got. I'll tell you. Having money and running the Smith and the Wallace family business, there's a lot to this, isn't there? How many of you got way more training in this, these areas than you could ever use in your lifetime way before today? Not many hands. Maybe none. You got to protect your assets. Proverbs 27, 12 says, The prudent see danger and they seek refuge. There's danger to your finances. 
And uh, let me tell you about my sister, Joanne. She was married at 19 years old to a guy who was a commercial fisherman, age 26. His name was Arthur. And <clears throat> uh, Arthur was the breadwinner, and Joanne was not working much outside the home. She was 19 years old through high school. They got married, good Christian couple, and about a year and a half into the marriage, they were going to have their first baby. They lived on Grand Manan Island, total population of 2,500 people, one little hospital that does a pretty good job. If you cut your finger, they'll put stitches on there. If you have the flu, you know, they give you a flu shot. And so they do help with a lot of good things. It's great that the island has it. But the doctor for many decades now have always recommended to the women having babies you'd probably be better off going on to the mainland before you have the baby because if anything goes wrong, you'll be better prepared for it. And so Joanne goes on the mainland, stays with my sister Kathy for three weeks leading up, and Arthur is actually doing the kind of fishing right then that you fish at night. Remember I told you about that? And then you sleep during the day. The day came for the baby to be born. I'll try to make this quick. Uh, it's uh, 4 o'clock in the morning. Gets a call on the CB radio because nobody had these things, uh, cell phones, and uh, says, sail to port, tie up, head to St. John Hospital, your wife's having the baby. And so he sails into port, gets there about 8 o'clock in the morning, starts driving towards the hospital. At about 9.30, Joanne had the baby, and Arthur hadn't showed up yet. 10 o'clock, 10.30, Arthur hadn't showed up yet. My dad was at the hospital with Joanne, happiest day of her life, baby born, Arthur. Must have had a flat tire, something went wrong. No cell phone, no CB radio in his car. So my dad jumps in his car, starts driving towards Blacks Harbor, New Brunswick, towards uh, where Arthur would be coming from, comes around a corner, sees emergency vehicles, a tow truck towing a truck out of the river, he recognizes it, parks the car, walks up, says, were there any survivors? They said no. My sister's husband died, fell asleep at the wheel, went over a guardrail, submerged into the river, and died at the very moment that his firstborn baby was being born. What was once for two hours my sister's happiest day of her life became her worst nightmare as my dad made the long 20-minute drive back to the hospital to tell her and crush her dreams that her husband had just died on the way to the hospital. Now, a couple days later, after kind of the smoke cleared and everybody was just still in complete shock, somebody mentioned something about life insurance, and somebody else jumped up and said, well, I'm sure that this is a busy fishing season for him, and there's nurseries to paint and getting ready for babies, there wouldn't have been any thought for that. And Joanne raises her hand and says, yeah, well, we might have done something like that. You see, about two months ago, Arthur invited a financial guy into our home, and he took down some information because Arthur said, we're going to be parents. We need to be responsible. We need to get life insurance. And they filled out some papers, sent one check off for about $100, with this guy, it had never heard a word since for two months until the baby was born. They checked into it. He had effective life insurance of $250,000 on himself, which back then, 31 years ago, would have been worth like a million bucks today. Saved my sister's financial life and everything life. Because on top of being faced with a baby to raise by yourself and your world being turned upside down, to have the financial strain of no job, no way to care for anything, and now I have a baby and no husband and we got a car and we got a house and we got a boat and all these things, it saved her life. She sold everything that they had, went off to Kingswood University, spent a couple of years there, regrouped, was able to go to college, do some things. Not a financial concern in the world. Why? Because he took care of business and saved her life. Remarried two wonderful more children and 
her life is amazing the last 25 to 30 years. But it was all because Arthur protected his wife from disaster that would never, ever happen in one in a million years. I've told that story all over the world now, and nobody's ever told me that they've ever known of a situation just like that where somebody was killed on the way to the hospital to see their newborn baby. But it did happen there. And so some of you in the room today are way underinsured with life insurance. And you know who you are, and you need to be responsible. Before you invest money, if you have people dependent on you, children still young, and a mortgage and all these things, you've got to be responsible. And to younger ages, again, even though it's a custom decision, I would say 10 times your uh, family household income is a good place to start for younger people. You could use more, but that's way more than most have. So if your household income is $75,000, that's $750,000. That's not too much. And you want to get the cheapest term life insurance, not for cash value, just for death benefit. It's for an emergency that is likely not to happen, but if it does, your family, like my sister, would be devastated financially forever, a hole she would never get out of. And so you've got to have proper life insurance. Time doesn't permit me to go into who should have what at what age. As you get older, here's the good news. You can outlive your need for life insurance. Yes, have a party. You lived beyond the need of it. So what you have to ask yourself to do today is review your life insurance and say, do I have too little or do I have too much? There's a time when all the kids are gone. Yay, party, and everything's paid off. Bigger party, and you've got lots of retirement assets saved up, and you're like, why do I even need this anymore? Well, you may not. Depends. What, what's the purpose of it now? So make sure you take care of that. So I think we got some slides coming up real quick. Life insurance, next one. Disability insurance. There are certain people that are self-employed that what you're doing here is you're insuring your income. You know who you are. Insuring your income because if something happens to your income-producing ability, that's almost as bad as a death. Next. Number three is long-term care insurance. My dad spent three years in the nursing home. My mom spent 10 years with Alzheimer's, five years of home care that we paid, and five years of full-blown nursing home. It can be costly, even in Canada. So you may want to look in. I'm not saying everyone needs it, but you need to recognize that that is something that's out there. Next one, number four. Estate planning. That's protecting your assets. Is estate planning. Making sure that you've done proper. Now that you own stuff, if you get in your 50s and 60s and 70s and 80s, you hopefully have something to show for it now. Some assets. How do you protect those assets? Pass them on to the next generation. And we're going to cover that more in a second. So number five, wills and powers of attorney. You need a will. If it's a husband, you need a will and a wife. You need a will package. So husband needs a will. This is what I want to happen if I die. Wife needs the same. And then you need powers of attorney documents. You can get those from an estate planning attorney, I'm sure, right here in Yarmouth. Sometimes you can even print them off on the Internet if you want to get really cheap. I say if you work 40, 50 years for everything you've got, let's leave it to the professionals. It could be a, a few hundred dollars and that's it. But if you need something, you can even write out a will and probably get it uh, witnessed and notarized or whatever you call it up here. And at least it's better than nothing. But you need a will because Jane Bryant Quinn said, you, you will die, you own stuff, someone will get that stuff. And either you can decide which is the stewardship responsible thing to do, or you just leave it to chance and everybody else and they fight over it. Number six, living trust. Sometimes a living trust, even in Canada, is good. Ginny's sister, Pat, who went to St. Mary's College, got a degree, you'd never believe it. She was born with juvenile rheumatoid arthritis. She's 60, 
three years old, probably weighs 62 pounds, soaking wet. Her body is shriveled up. She's in a wheelchair, and um, she's been that way basically her whole life. She's in an electric wheelchair. She is a miracle. She actually lives on her own, in her own little house. I mean, it, if you saw her, you would say there is one in a trillion chance that a human being could do that, and she is. But she gets government uh, substance and, and help, though she still works as a school teacher because she got like two degrees in the time that most people could get one at St. Mary's, um, but she can't work full time. Her ability and disability doesn't allow that, so she gets government assistance. So Jenny has her as a sister and then another sister and a brother. So four in the family, three girls, one boy. If Pat inherits things from Jenny's parents through just a regular will, she could lose her government uh, assistance and help with medication and all kinds of things that she can't do without. So we set it up with an attorney where her share goes into a trust, and I'm actually the trustee of that trust. And so her share, let's say it's $50,000, just picking a number, goes into that trust. It doesn't go to her. It goes to a trust in her name, and I can divvy it out for her hair, care and health and well-being. And it's not illegal. You're not getting around the government. These are put into place for that very purpose. And so we've protected her. Of anyone in the family that needs the most help and protection, it's her. So there's different ways that you can do that. Uh, next page. So now number eight is leave a legacy. Leave a legacy. Proverbs 13, 22, a good man leaves an inheritance for his children's children. You need to plan for how your stuff is distributed if you want to be a good steward and have it go that way. And it's not always, if there's children here with their parents, don't be mad at me when I say this. You shouldn't just think in terms of, well, I've got three children. If there's anything left, it's a third, a third, a third. Any people in here love God? Love the church? Love investing in the church? Think the church has a great mission? You want to leave a legacy? Leave some of your money to the church. You gave your whole living life. Now, let me back up even further. And I'm going to get preaching here, preachers. Is that okay? Cheer me on. You're going to want, you want, you're going to want me to say this. And I say it because I believe it, not that someone put me up to it. If we believe that the Bible teaches us to be a steward during our lifetime, it also teaches us to be, in being a steward, we are not an owner. You know what's freeing? I don't own anything. It's been entrusted to me to be a good steward and a manager. But I'm not the owner of the Benson family business, and neither is my wife. God is. He owns it all. He can give it today. He can take it away tomorrow. And you know what? I like having extra so that I can give away, and I like our life. But we also liked our life when we had like a thousandth of what we have today. It was a good life. It was each other. It was God. It was, you know, we, we never missed very many meals. So maybe a few. Um, so I believe that I don't own anything. So if I'm to be a steward in our life, should I be a steward when I die too? I mean, let me ask you this. So if there's anyone like me here today that believes that everything you own Ultimately, if you're a child of God, is God's and he just lets you use it and then you're going to leave it behind and go on to glory and you're, you brought nothing into this world, you're going to take nothing out. Are we on the same page here? So if that's the case in our life, does something weird happen when we die that all of a sudden this that belonged to God reverts 100% to us and now it's ours 
and we just do with it what we want? Or if we loved to invest in our living days, how about living be, or investing in that same mission beyond the grave? So, I don't have a Bible verse to, maybe you do. There's people here who know the Bible ten times more than I do, but I don't have a Bible verse from this, but it just makes sense to me. And that is that if we give at least 10%, and there's nothing magic in my opinion about just stopping at 10%. I think it should be a lot more than that if you really become a, a, a real life giver. But um, if you give that, what if every person on the South Shore that loved Jesus and the mission and the church that they go to and their family has been forever affected and changed and instruct, instructed and educated all of their life, what if every family, couple, older, saints of the church, when they die, if they just said the first 10%, when it's all before it's divvied out, goes back to God and let the kids squander the other 90%. And I say that not because I'm picking on anyone, but in the United States, the average estate that is inherited is gone in 92 days. 92 days. They've blown through it all. So, I believe it should be more than that. We're planning on leaving more than 10% to Southern Wesleyan University, Kingswood University, our church, our little church on Grand Manan, all kinds of places that we believe in to go, and then the kids are going to be more than well off. I don't think we really do them a favor by them waking up one day and we're gone and they won the lottery. I appreciate money that I work for more than anything else. Now, the Bible does talk about leaving an inheritance, though, and it's not just in money. It's in legacy of the life that we live. And how about this as your final example, letting your kids and loved ones know how much you love God and the church and the mission that was part of your life for your entire life. I think that's good. And all the preachers and, and board members in the room, you should be amening. But nobody put me up to that. I believe that 100%. When you do up your will, some of it should go to the church. Some of it should go to other charities and things that you love. There's still going to be plenty left over for people. If your kids inherit anything, if you're like me, I gave them, we gave them way more in their bringing up years than probably we needed to or should have. I don't feel like money-wise I owe them anything. Maybe you do. Now, we help them Every week, because we want to, not because we feel obligated. We love investing in our kids. They're making good financial and godly decisions. We're really blessed. All three of our children love Jesus. Their families are in church. They're, they're, they're giving people. They're not perfect. They made a lot of mistakes. Not near as many as I did, but plenty. But, and, and we love to give while we live. Not just leave it behind when we die, but I do believe in leaving a legacy is really about live the life that you lived and you can't live on after you die, but the church does and the mission does. And I want to invest in some things that I know that 20 years down the road, 40 and 100 years from now, those dollars weren't being spent in 92 days. They were being invested for the kingdom. That's good preaching. I don't care what they say. All right. Time for questions soon. So we got to go to number nine. Number nine is take action and get help. Okay, so I'm going to say the word of the day that this, this group, and I'm going to see how loud you guys can help. All right, everybody with me? Here we go. So I'm going to do their section all of you are going to do their section. Information is good. Is great. You got to take action. 
Don't write these notes down. Don't listen to this video later and not take action. You've got to take action, and you need to invest in help. Don't be afraid to pay for something that will benefit you forever. When you pay for good financial advice, and today this costs you. It costs you time. I don't think it costs you money, but it costs you time to be here. When you make an investment in that, I believe that if you implement it, it will pay big dividends. You need to take action and you need to get help. How do you get that help? Read those books. What did I tell you? That formal education like college. I'm certainly not the most educated person out there, but I have a master's degree, seven years of, of college, uh, my whole life, I've been a learner. I believe that, that uh, readers are leaders, leaders are readers, and earners are learners. Learners are earners. So I want to learn, and I want to read, and I want to fill myself up, and I constantly do. When I put one book down, I probably have three more on the go already. I'm constantly, constantly, constantly. Why? Because formal education can make me a living, but self-education can make me a fortune, or really can really change lives. So you've got to take action. You've got to get help. Get help. Go to Joe Sangal, Dave Ramsey. Go to our website, beaconcm.com. We've got a lot of tools in there you can get. They're free, just like the library was free in 1977, 78, 79, and 80 when I was at Bethany Bible College. Which I, does anyone remember a day when Bethany Bible College was here in Yarmouth? Wasn't it here? I thought so. Your, your mom went here when it was, uh, Jenny's mom went to Bethany Bible College when it was here in Yarmouth. Um, but you, you've, got to ta- you've got to take responsibility. Here's the problem. Nobody is taking on the responsibility to teach you, so you've got to teach yourself. So if the best thing that you do when you leave here is to say, I guess I was waiting for someone to come along and just, you know, guide me and tell me what to do. Give me all the answers. I got to go find them. My job today is not to give you every answer, but to tell you where to go look and that you do need to go look and that there is help there where you look. The resources are 100 times better today than when I looked at the libraries in Sussex, New Brunswick on the Internet there's a lot of garbage, but there's a lot of good. And there, some of the things that I'm telling you are good. And procrastination is by far the greatest enemy to financial freedom. So number 10 is excel at giving. What doing well in numbers 1 through 9 do is lead to number 10. And number 10 is the funnest way in the world to live. To excel at at giving. There's many people that are distressed inside because they have a heart to give, but their pocketbook says, what, me? And they really want to. I'm no better, certainly, certainly not better than anyone here. You probably have a a heart 10 times bigger than mine to give. But just because you want to give doesn't mean you can give because you haven't gotten one through nine down right. But I'm giving you the tools so you can get to here. So if you need a motivation, the happiest people in the world are givers. They're encouragers. I, I mean, come on now. Who do you like to be around? Somebody who's constantly building you up and encouraging you or someone who's constantly taking away and discouraging you? I mean, that's a no brainer, right? You want to be with a giver. And you know what? The happiest people on earth are givers who every day they just want to invest in, whether it's dollars, time, whatever. They want to give to people what they have. I, back to the cars. I have a fairly nice car. And buying cars, although I don't buy new I buy two, three years old, let the big depreciation go down, find something with low miles, and then drive it for a long time if I can. That's how you buy a car. And I'm kind of a car guy, okay? If there's car nerds out there, 
like in my spare time, beyond all this other stuff, Jenny be like, okay, do you have your eye on another car? No, I just like looking. And, I like, and in my office, all the young people, when they want to go buy a car, they come to me because I know what they should buy. I'm going to help them buy a car. And so I'm kind of a car guy, but so I like them personally. I have a couple of grandkids that are beyond me. They teach me about cars, but I listen and I learn from them. But what I'm getting at is this. I've never bought a car for her and I that gave me a tenth of the joy that giving cars to our parents meant. The first time that I had car keys in my hand and I had driven a car that I bought to my parents' driveway in the dark and they didn't see. And we arrived there just before Christmas, 20 years ago. And we're standing around in the kitchen and we hadn't even brought our suitcases into the house yet. We were there to come back home to Grandma Nan Island for Christmas. And I said, oh, Dad, just one more thing. I said, hold out your hand. I walk across the kitchen floor, and I pull keys out of my car, and I put them in his hand. And he was like, oh, no, son, you've done so much for me. I said, Dad, your car is disaster, and you've got to get to the hospital. My mom's not in good shape. You need to be able to have trustworthy uh, car to get through to the hospital in the winter. I bought you a car, and I can tell you that if I'm alive 20 years from now, I can close my eye and still see the expression on their faces and still feel the joy in our hearts from giving. We're not all going to be able to give cars. Don't let that, I mean, just be a giver. Give people your time. Bake them a cake. Do something special. Do little things. What you can afford to do, you do. And be a giver, and it comes back to you a hundred times over. Givers will never be poor. Because they'll be rich, maybe not from dollars. They'll be rich from the experiences of giving. And I want you to experience that, even in a greater way than maybe you already do. Is there any other things up here? Let's see, what are we ending with? Here's the three top takeaways. You still taking notes? Now, you got a, you got a star of your own, but I made my own. Number one, Pete, what would be the three biggest things? Pray about your finances daily. When you pray about them, you know what it does? Is it makes you more aware in how you spend your money. It, if you get up in the morning and you pray God to guide you, and then when you go to do something dumb with your money, he slaps you upside the head. I mean, AJ and Brian, they go out in the morning and they work out. Now, I know they're not quite right anyway, we'd all agree, but they, they go work out first thing in the morning. But here, here's what I know about them. The harder you sacrifice and get up when it's dark and you don't feel like it and you go to the gym to take care of yourself, now, I know that, you know, even though I don't know them very well, like me, they probably blow it some. But I can tell you that people who work out regularly are a lot more aware of what also they eat and other things that they do throughout the day because they don't want to undo all that hard work. When you pray about your finances, and you've mouthed those words and asked God to help you, it's a lot harder to then turn around and do some boneheaded, ridiculous, stupid thing with your money that you know you shouldn't do, but you just do. So pray about your finances daily. Number two, work your plan weekly. I said meet monthly, but you've got to at least work the plan weekly. And number three, you've, this is not the end. This is the beginning. It's ongoing education and accountability. I have trained other advisors, hundreds across the country, and I'm still learning every day. And every day I learn new things. I'm like, they got me up there training people? I didn't even know that before today. I will never be able to die because there's too much I haven't yet learned. 
So you've got to be a lifelong learner. And money in situations, uh, Angie back here, CPA, do, do tax laws ever change? Yeah, they change. So things change. So you've got to be aware. And so this is an ongoing experience. It's not like you arrive and then you can just forget about it. It's an ongoing education and that last word, accountability. You got you to gotta have accountability partner. You got to find someone that says, okay, I'm laying out my soul bare to you. Here's my goals. Here's my struggles. Here's what I'm working at. I need you to be tough on me. I need you to pick me up every now and then, but also need you to kick me in the seat of the pants when I need it, and I need to be accountable. I need to be accountable. Any other thing there? That's it. That's how to reach us. Um, um, if you have any questions or anything, there's that, and then um, I'm done. So what are we going to do here, Christy? Christy?